Prayer and fasting are important in the life of a disciple of Jesus and the church community. As we pray and fast together, it strengthens us as a church as one body. This April 28 to 30, Wednesday to Friday, we will observe a three-day church-wide reset prayer and fasting with the theme Recenter. Recenter is about delving deeper into the aspects of our soul, including our will, our mind, and our body, and learning how to pay attention and care for this. When our souls are unhealthy and are in chaos, our lives and our relationships are affected. To recenter means to move from a place of ruin where the soul is disintegrated and disconnected with God, with other people, and with creation, to a reorganized life of wholeness, harmony, and connection. We invite you to join and take note of these three important things. First, we encourage you to practice a spiritual discipline daily. Every day at 7 in the morning, we will release guides for practicing spiritual disciplines such as slowing down, practicing the presence of God, breath prayer, and examine. These practices are easy to do and easy to follow. They will help create spaces for connecting with God intimately as you fast and pray. Second, at 8 p.m. every night, we will gather online to pray as one body, as one church. We will pray for our families, our church, and our nation. And third, on these dates, ministry activities, life groups, and journey group meetings will be on break for us to devote our time and energy and collective prayer. We hope that you can join us this reset and experience collective prayer and fasting with your CBCP family. Let's carry each other's burden through prayer, strengthen one another, and together, recenter our souls to God. A blessed Sunday, CBCP family, and to all of you watching us online today. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Praise God for another opportunity that we can come together and worship the Lord as one church and one family. Let's praise God for this time as He has given us the chance to worship Him through our songs and to hear from His timeless word. As we prepare our hearts, let us listen and reflect to this song of praise. Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. The Lord sustains all who fall and rises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. Let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for another time that we can come together and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity that we can listen to your word. Help us, O God, prepare our hearts and help us to learn from you. Teach us your ways, O Lord, so that we may obey you faithfully. Give us the wisdom and the strength to obey you so that we can live a life, Lord God, that honors and pleases you. Thank you, Father, for today. We welcome your presence and be with us, O God, throughout this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to our online worship. Last week, we started a brand new series entitled, Blueprint for a Life of Wisdom. This series is a study on the book of Ecclesiastes, which is one of the wisdom books in the Bible. And it is our prayer that the Lord will use this study to teach us how to live a life of wisdom. That way, we can have a life of meaning, purpose, and satisfaction. And we can live a life without regrets during our short life here on earth. Today, we'll look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and I invite you to open your Bibles with me and follow along. Our message for today is entitled, The Experiment of Life. Louis Pasteur is a French scientist, chemist, and microbiologist. He is best known for inventing the process of pasteurization. Pasteurization kills microbes and prevents spoilage in milk and other goods. Louis Pasteur had another challenge in his time. In those days, people and animals had a disease called rabies. The dogs with rabies would become crazy and wild and they would bite people. And there was no known cure, so contracting rabies is considered a death sentence. Not only that, but the infected person would also die a terrible and painful death. So Pasteur decided to perform an experiment. In 1885, a nine-year-old boy named Joseph Meister was brought to Pasteur. Joseph was badly beaten by a stray dog infected by rabies. So the death of this young boy was almost certain. Thinking that he had little to lose, Louis Pasteur decided to do an experiment. He extracted this rabies virus from the spinal cord of a rabbit and then injected it into this young boy. And lo and behold, the boy was cured. Louis Pasteur's experiment saved the life of Joseph Meister. But not only that, Pasteur's experiment eventually saved countless number of lives, and his discovery paved the way for the modern era of immunization through the use of inactivated vaccines. Today, we'll look at another man's experiment. This man also saw a problem that he wanted to solve. Why? Because this problem brought about misery, not just to a few people, but to all of humanity especially to those who have been bitten by the harsh reality of life. And this is his working hypothesis. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. As we go through the book of Ecclesiastes, we will see how this man, the teacher, proved his hypothesis through his various experiments. Now, most Bible scholars believe that King Solomon wrote the main portion of Ecclesiastes. And most of it, in chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us that this book contains the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. The word teacher in Hebrew is the word koheleth, which means the one who gathers or assembles the group. Koheleth is often translated as a teacher or preacher. So in our study, we'll call him either Solomon, koheleth, or teacher. As mentioned last week, there are people, even Christians, who find this book strange and even disturbing. Why? Because of what the teacher says, life is meaningless. And Ecclesiastes contains things that may sound contradictory to the other biblical teachings. Now, we need to remember that Solomon was a man of extraordinary wisdom. He wanted to get his listeners to think more deeply about life. And how did he do this? 
like a philosophy teacher, he started his presentation with a troubling thought. Everything is meaningless. And in chapter 1, as we learned last week, the teacher tells us, as he observed nature, he came to realize that everything just goes around in circles. Life under the sun is so predictable. And not only that, life under the sun is toilsome, it's tiring and frustrating. And that is why life is meaningless. Today, we'll look at Solomon's experiments, the experiment of life. And we'll see that Solomon's findings here in chapter 2 are not only based on what he saw or observed from afar. Instead, his conclusions were based on the result of his own personal experience. It will be based on his own life experiment. So let's look at the different things that he did. Let's look at his research and experiment. The first, he conducted the pleasure test. Chapter 2, verse 1. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. And what's his goal? Verse 3 tells us, to see what was good for the people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. In short, Solomon embarked on this journey of an unrestrained quest for pleasure, to see if the meaning of life can be found in pleasure and enjoyment. Solomon tried experimenting with wine. Verse 3, I tried treating myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. Beside being a rich king, Solomon also enjoyed the best wine that he could have. And he drank it all, he tasted it all to see if it will give him satisfaction. Solomon also experimented with music and entertainment. He said, I provided myself with male and female singers. Did you know what's the most expensive concert ticket sold in our country so far? It was Madonna's concert held last 2016. One VIP ticket cost more than 57,000 pesos. But you know what? Despite the insane cost, her two nights concert was sold out. Well, I guess if you really like music and entertainment, you'd probably be willing to spend just to watch a concert and to hear your favorite singer or band sing. But for Solomon, he didn't just buy tickets to a concert. He purchased his own in-house band and singers. Solomon enjoyed first-class entertainment, the best artists, and the finest singers. He wanted to see if songs and music can satisfy his heart. Not only that, he also turned to women. He said, I provided myself the pleasures of men, many concubines. Solomon surrounded himself with women, and not just local women, but foreigners as well. The book of 1 Kings actually tells us that Solomon had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. Solomon could have a beauty pageant every day if he wanted to. But the difference is, all of these women are either his wife or concubine. Solomon had many women. And long before Hugh Hefner invented the Playboy Mansion, Solomon already had his own harem of women in the palace. Why? So that he could check and see if he can find meaning and satisfaction in sexual pleasure. Again, these experiments are Solomon's journey of an unrestrained quest for pleasure. He said, all that my eyes desired, I did not refuse. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. Now, only a handful of people in history and the world who can say this, one of which is King Solomon. But for the majority of the people in the world, including you and me, we don't have the choice, but we're forced to deny ourselves of many pleasures in life simply because we don't have the money or we don't have the power to get them. But here's a person who had no limits. Here is someone who had unlimited resources. He could have instant gratification and got everything he wanted. And since he's the king, he answered and was accountable to no one. And for his pleasure test, Solomon lived his life on the edge. He indulged himself in sex, wine, parties, music, and entertainment. He had the best of the best. But what did he discover at the end of his experiment? Listen to this. I said to myself, enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? This was Solomon's conclusion. The pursuit of pleasure is ultimately meaningless. He said, you know what? Pleasure brought no lasting satisfaction. My heart was still empty and pleasure has no lasting value. But Solomon did not stop there. He conducted his next experiment. This time, he tried the achievement test. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. First, he did the great works of big projects, and this is what he said. 
I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. And I planted them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate or to water a forest of growing trees. In his lifetime, Solomon built not just one house, but multiple houses. He made beautiful palaces and other great building projects. He also planted gardens and vineyards. And notice the words here, gardens, all kinds of fruit trees, to water or to irrigate. These words are to remind us of the Garden of Eden. And Bible scholars says that this was Solomon's attempt to recreate paradise and reconstruct the Garden of Eden. And notice also how the teacher repeatedly says these words, for myself, for myself. This phrase was actually repeated four times. The phrase for myself is not in contrast to for others, but this for myself is actually in contrast to doing a life for God. In other words, Solomon was living for himself and not for God. Not only that, Solomon also had great possessions and wealth. During this time, how did they measure wealth? Richness was measured by their possessions, how many flocks and herds they own, how many precious metals they have, and even how many slaves they have. And guess what? Solomon had all these things. Verse 7, I bought male and female slaves, and I had homegrown slaves. Solomon had many servants to take care of everything he needed. Having slaves helped him to live a life of comfort and ease. He also had great possessions of flocks and herds. Verse 7, I also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Solomon had an abundant food supply. Imagine having the finest meat and premium steaks every day. It's just like dining in a five-star restaurant. Eat all you can. This was the life of Solomon. And he continues, Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasures of the kings and provinces. Solomon was way beyond rich. He had large amounts of silver and gold. In fact, he made silver and gold as plentiful in Jerusalem as his stones. That's in 2 Chronicles 1.15. And all of King Solomon's drinking vessels were made of pure gold in 1 Kings chapter 10.21. Solomon had many treasures, different precious stones, exquisite jewelries, ivory carvings, and other expensive items. Next, not only did the teacher have projects and possessions, he also had popularity. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 9. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. Solomon became so famous that other rulers paid tribute to him. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 23 to 25. So King Solomon became greater and all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. All the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put in his heart. They brought every man his gift, articles of silver and gold, garments, Weapons, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. And if Solomon were alive today, he would be the first on Forbes' top 10 world's billionaires list. He would also made it to the Gallup's list of most widely ad admired people. And if, if Solomon was alive today, he would probably have millions of followers in his FB, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter accounts. He would be the envy of everyone. You see, Solomon lived the good life. Here's is what he said. Listen to this, verse 10. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart for any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. At first hearing, it seems Solomon did live the good life and found meaning in his pursuits. His heart was pleased with the reward for his labor. But if we look closer, here is what he actually concluded. Verse 11, Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity, all was meaningless, and striving after the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. Did you hear that? Solomon was a wise man. He kept his wisdom while trying to do his life experiment. And what did he conclude from his experiments? He said both the pursuit of pleasure and achievement are vanity, or meaningless. In Hebrew, the word vanity or meaningless is hebel, which means breath or vapor. It is something that quickly comes and goes. It's meaningless. It's empty. Solomon is saying that everything under the sun, life without God, everything under the sun, in this case, pleasure and achievement, all of these are fleeting and ultimately meaningless. 
They're like soap bubbles. It's pointless and useless. And so, we enjoy them for a moment, and then they pop, and then they're gone. Solomon also said that these pursuits are like chasing after the wind. All your effort will be pointless. Why? Because even though the wind can give you wonderful experience, it is something that you cannot keep. So here was a man who had it all. He had everything that many of us could only dream of. He had the opportunity and the means to go after his wildest dreams. Here is someone who had been there and done that. Solomon went as far as he could in terms of having wealth, achievements, and pleasure. And he reached the end of the road. But what did he discover? He tells us it's a dead end. It's empty. And there is nothing there. Dear friends, God through Solomon is saying this to us. The path of pleasure and achievement are, are both dead ends. They would fail to satisfy Others who have gone through the same path have reached the end and also told us the same thing. There's nothing there. And yet many people would still go down that path. Boris Becker used to be the world's number one professional tennis player. At age 17, he became the youngest champion in the history of the men's singles at Wimbledon. He was a Wimbledon champion, not once, but three times. He was at the very top of the tennis world, yet he was on the brink of suicide. Listen to what he said. I had won Wimbledon twice before, once as the youngest player. I was rich. I had all the material possessions I needed. It's the old song of the movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide. They have everything and yet they are so unhappy. I had no inner peace. I was a puppet on a string. But I wonder how many of us genuinely believe Becker and Solomon's conclusion. Not many would still like to pursue pleasure and achievements thinking these things could make us happy. The Chinese has a saying, One's heart won't die until it reaches the Yellow River. It means that a person won't stop until one reaches his goal. And that is true for many of us. You see, many of us still believe this lie. I'd be happy if only I have more or better. I'd be happy if only I had more or better. Tim Keller said this, instead of saying there's something wrong with the path, we say it's because we haven't gone far enough. And that is true for many of us. Instead of us ag agreeing with Solomon and there's something wrong with the pursuit of worldly things, we say we haven't experienced satisfaction because we haven't gone far enough. And so we tell ourselves, if only I have more money, more achievements, more comfort, then I'd be happy. If only I have a better house, a better car, a better spouse, then I'll be satisfied. If only I have more respect, if more people love me and admire me, then I will be fulfilled. But this is all a lie. Now Solomon is a wise scientist. He considered other options for his experiment. He said, pleasure is foolishness. So how about the opposite? Let's try wisdom instead. And so he did his third experiment, the wisdom test. And this is what he did, verse 12. So I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? As Solomon was testing wisdom, he was initially delighted because it looked promising. He said, And I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's heart are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Here Solomon was saying that there's some benefit Yes, there's some advantage of wisdom over folly. Wisdom is better than foolishness. But then here is what he realized, verse 14. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. And what fate is that? And I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. For there is no lasting remembrance of the wise as with the fool. Inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise man and the fool alike, they die. You see, this is the inescapable reality of life. Everybody dies. As one writer said, the statistics on death have not changed. One out of one person dies. The mortality rate is 100%. We will all die. And this is what Solomon is saying. You either die as a wise person or you die as a fool. 
But either way, you will still die. Again, Solomon tells us, look at me. I'm a great success. Look at what I possess and what I enjoy. But what good are these things? What happens to fools would eventually happen to me as well. I will also die. And so even wisdom is ultimately meaningless. Recently, we've heard the news that some convicted criminals in prison died because of COVID-19. We've also listened to the sad news of medical frontliners who died of the exact same cause. So however you live your life, whether you've done good or evil, you'll die. Whether you've been wise or unwise, we'll all end up in the same way. Death. And this reality frustrated Solomon. Yes, there is some advantage in wisdom, but what's the point? You'd still die. That's why he said, verse 17, So I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after the wind. Now please don't misunderstand me. The teacher is not saying stop pursuing wisdom. And for all of you who are studying, for those of you who are students, I'm not saying don't study anymore. But here is the point. Don't make academic success, the pursuit of education, or wisdom become your ultimate means to find meaning and purpose in life. Why? Because you won't get it from that. Meaning and true satisfaction is not found in wisdom. After concluding that he can find meaning in pleasure, in achievements, in wisdom, Solomon then proceeded with his next experiment. This time, he turned his attention to his work, and he did the work test. What happened? This is what he said in verses 18 to 19. Thus, I hated my labor. I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Did you hear that? Solomon said, I hated all my hard work. Why? because I must eventually leave it to someone who will come after me. Yes, I did my best to act wisely, to gain what I now have. But after I die, I don't know if that next person after me would be wise or foolish. Friends, this is the same for all of us. When we leave this world, we'll also leave behind our money and possession. And there's no guarantee if those who would come after us would be wise or as diligent as we have been and keep what we have worked for. How many of you have heard about the third generation curse in business? In March 2017, KPMG and CPA Australia surveyed 100 firms in Singapore and they estimated that only 13% of those family-run businesses would survive until the third generation. And we've seen this happen in our country. The reality is only a small percentage of family-run businesses are able to extend and stay strong up to the third generation. And why is this? One business columnist said it this way, the first generation creates the business, the second one maintains it, but the third one fritters or squanders it away. This is the third generation curse. And this is what actually Solomon realized. Solomon continues, Therefore I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who had labored with his wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he gives up his legacy to the one who has not labored with them, this too is vanity and a great evil. All of his life, Solomon worked hard and exerted effort to build his wealth and accumulate everything he could. But then he realized he would eventually pass his treasures and the fruits of his labor to someone who has not worked for it. And this truth added to Solomon's frustration. And in his despair, he again asked himself, What's the point of working hard? What's the point of working hard? Verse 22 to 23. What does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Because all his days his task is painful and grievous. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. Do you know someone like this? Someone who worked hard and sacrificed so much and yet he died suddenly. And that person had to leave everything behind that he had worked for. Thus, it is all empty and useless. You see, Solomon suffered the same fate, though he did not live long enough to witness what happened. After King Solomon died in 1913 BC, his son Rehoboam became king 
But here's the irony. Solomon was so wise, yet his son was the complete opposite. During King David and Solomon's reign, the United Kingdom of Israel experienced its golden age. The people lived in prosperity, abundance, and peace. But soon after Rehoboam, the third generation, sat on the throne, what happened? Most of what David and Solomon worked for was lost. Rehoboam acted foolishly by following the unwise advice of his friends. What happened? Being a king in just less than a week, he already split the kingdom into two. Ten tribes rebelled against Rehoboam and only two tribes remained loyal to him. Solomon's toil and labor in building his empire were wasted. It was all meaningless. Now after Solomon's experiment, let's look at the result. The teacher's experiment showed that his hypothesis was correct. Everything is meaningless. The pursuit of pleasure, achievements, wisdom, and even work in and of itself, it's all empty and meaningless. None of these things will give lasting satisfaction. They're like chasing after the wind. Now let me share with you a little footnote here. Another wisdom book is the book of Job. And Job is about a man who finds that life is meaningless because he lost everything. On the other hand, Ecclesiastes is about a man who sees life as meaningless, even though he had everything. Job was a man who lost everything and he said life is meaningless. And Ecclesiastes is about a man who had everything but sees life still as meaningless. So just think about that. Now in light of all of what Solomon realized, what does he recommend? Verse 24. Here is what he said. There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. Now this idea that there is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink, it's repeated several times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And Solomon is teaching his listeners how to live life under the sun. And what's his recommendation? Enjoy life. Make the best out of this short and difficult life. Enjoy life. Now you may be wondering, I thought pursuing pleasure is meaningless. How then is enjoying life different from pursuing happiness? Let's look at the next part. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him. Did you hear that? Solomon said, enjoyment is from the hand of God. Enjoyment is God's gift. And that is why he said, for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without God? Again, let's make this clear. The teacher is not saying that life plus enjoyment is vanity. He is not saying that, but this is what he's saying. Life plus enjoyment without God, that is vanity. Life plus enjoyment without God, that is meaningless. Did you see the difference? Without God, you can never experience real and lasting satisfaction. Why? Because both life and enjoyment are God's gift to us. Both life and enjoyment are God's gift to us. You see, there's nothing wrong with working, having wealth, and enjoying. In fact, we reflect God's image when we do these things. But what Solomon is saying is this, apart from God, these things are empty. True enjoyment does not come from material things or people, but true enjoyment is a gift from God and real pleasure comes from the hand of God. And the Apostle Paul teaches this same idea to his apprentice, Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Dear brothers and sisters, here is the lesson that Ecclesiastes teaches us. Enjoy life with God, and with God's gift of life and enjoyment, Make the best out of this short and difficult life. Enjoy life with God and with God's gift of life and enjoyment, make the best out of this short and difficult life. Now, let's reflect on these two applications. First, renounce your idols and put God first. You see, chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes is an idol buster. It is an idol buster. It shows us that if you make anything most important in your life other than God, then you'll probably be deeply disappointed. If you try to find meaning and satisfaction and pleasure in achievements, in wisdom or work, they will let you down. And this COVID pandemic has shown us the reality of this truth. In an instant, people can lose their health and their years of savings, and you can quickly lose your business and your work that you sacrifice so much for. And ultimately, all these things are just like vapor. 
Solomon teaches us that to live a life of wisdom, renounce your idol and put God first. Live for Him and not for yourself. To live a life of wisdom, renounce your idols and put God first. Live for Him and not for yourself. And if you do this, then all these other things like pleasure, achievement, and work, all these things can find their proper place in your life. But if you try to make these things as your God, you'll only be frustrated and disappointed. Why? Because pursuing idols follow the law of the diminishing returns. And this is the problem. The idols that you're chasing, like money, achievements, or pleasure, these may give you satisfaction and a great experience the first time, but the next time you would need more and more, and you would need more just to get to the same level of satisfaction, and then afterwards, you'd feel empty. But on the other hand, Jesus Christ gives us this promise in John 10.10. 10. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is what Jesus said. So dear friends, remember that without God, life is vanity. It's empty and futile. But with God in His rightful place in our lives, life would be full of meaning, purpose, and satisfaction. Finally, receive and accept God's solution to death. Solomon tells us that life under the sun is meaningless. Why? Because life is difficult and then you die. You see, if you read the whole book of Ecclesiastes, you will realize that death is the ultimate reason why life is meaningless. Death is the great equalizer. Wise or fool, you die. Rich or poor, young or old, you die. Educated or not, healthy or strong, you die. Death destroys all accomplishments and we cannot escape it. Again, Ecclesiastes tells us that life is difficult and then you die. Therefore, it is death that makes all of life meaningless. And this is the bad news that the Bible tells us. And the reality that we cannot escape death is much more highlighted now by this COVID-19 pandemic. You know, some of you have lost a child, a spouse, or a parent. Some of you have lost a sibling, a relative, or a friend. And many of you are worried because you have loved ones who are struggling for their life right now because of COVID. But the Bible also tells us the good news. And this is the good news that we preach. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He became man and subjected Himself to death, the very thing that makes life meaningless. Jesus was betrayed by one of His closest friends and denied by another. He was deserted by the crowds who used to follow Him, and He was left by His own disciples. The perfect and sinless man, He suffered at the hand of sinful people. He was beaten and mocked. He was cursed, humiliated, and crucified. And on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus experienced the meaninglessness of life that Solomon or any one of us couldn't even imagine. But then, through his death, Jesus defeated death. He took away the power and sting of death. Your brothers and sisters, this is the good news that we have. This is the gospel. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could He die, and only by dying could He break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could He set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. In other words, our Lord Jesus Christ died and experienced a life of vanity and meaninglessness so that through Him, you and I may live and find the meaning of life. Jesus died so that through Him, you and I may live and find the meaning of life. Today, we've learned about the life experiment of a person who had it all and did it all. And yet, he concluded that life is meaningless. May all of us learn this important lesson and wisdom from the teacher, that pursuing pleasure, achievements, wisdom, and work is empty and meaningless but the real meaning and lasting satisfaction are only found in God, who is the giver of life and our enjoyment. Pursuing pleasure, achievements, wisdom, and work is empty and meaningless, but the real meaning and lasting satisfaction are only found in God, who is the giver of our life and enjoyment. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for teaching us through the book of Ecclesiastes. Lord, indeed, life is difficult, 
life is full of suffering and life lord god is meaningless and many of us are suffering lord god difficulties and we're trying to do our best just to fill lord god our hearts lord god to fill that hunger and thirst lord god with things that we believe that would satisfy us and make us happy but lord thank you for reminding us through solomon that there is no meaning lord god in pursuing pleasure achievements wealth even wisdom lord god and work lord god in and of themselves lord god apart from you father help us lord god to live a life that truly find that meaning lord god in life and that is acknowledging you O god that you are the source of everything that we have our life our breath lord god even the enjoyment lord god it is your gift to us help us lord god to live a life of humility a life of surrender a life of faith towards you father for many of us we are afraid of the things going on around us we are afraid of our tomorrow we are afraid of the economy we are afraid of our for our health we are afraid for our loved ones we are just afraid lord god just we don't know how long will this last oh god but we submit to you help us oh god not to worry but to put our faith in you knowing that everything comes from you every good gift comes from you lord our eyes look to you give us our daily bread give us provision lord god, at the proper time and help us to appreciate even the small blessings the gifts that you have given us and allow us lord god to live a life of contentment during this challenging time i pray for those lord god who are going through suffering and difficulty enable them lord god to experience your healing grace help them lord god to endure make their body strong and improve allow them lord god to experience your healing touch and make them whole restore them oh god we pray for those who are struggling lord god in making uh both ends meet lord god uh, provide for them financially help them lord god in their work in their businesses grant them lord god the wisdom to know how to best proceed i pray lord god for those who are worried lord god about tomorrow who are um who are having having an anxiety lord god i pray that you grant them peace help them lord god to walk by faith and not by sight just assure them lord god of your presence for all of us lord god Remember us, O Lord, and be our shepherd. Provide for everything that we need. Lord, you promise that you are our shepherd and we shall not be in one. And help us, Lord God, to live a life of faith that honors and pleases you. Help us, Lord God, during this challenging time to pray for our country, to love our leaders, to pray for those who are in need and to help them, O God. Help us to love you and to love one another. And Lord God, during this time, may we be salt and light, Lord God, to the places that you have called us, Lord God. I pray for all of those, Lord God, who are especially going through the many difficult challenges right now. Please let your presence be with them and grant them your peace and comfort. Thank you, Father. As you bow your heads, let me bless you. As you face the challenges of today, may you live with wisdom and may you find the meaning of life. May you acknowledge God who is the giver of our lives and enjoyment. May you live for Him with all your heart mind, soul, and strength. May you love others as Christ loved you. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. God bless us all. See you again next time.